Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to week two of The Caring Economy with Toby Usnick. I am honored and thrilled to have my dear friend and colleague from years gone by, Sally Sussman, who is EVP and Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at Pfizer, that world-renowned pharmaceutical giant. And uh, Sally, we're going to jump right into it. I'd love you to just start by telling our audiences a little bit about about you and your journey. How did you get to where you are today? And what were particularly, what were some of the pivots that made for interesting movements in your career? Thanks so much, Toby. And I'm just really thrilled to be talking with you and your listeners. So when I was a little girl, I really wanted to make positive change in the world. And I thought I might be the mayor of my town or perhaps a journalist, some kind of noble profession. And after college, I went directly to government and I spent five or six years there and candidly, frankly, found it hard to make positive change from within government. Mm. After many years, one of my great accomplishments was turning an and to an or in a sentence, which <laughs> didn't feel all that gratifying. Uh, so I had an idea. I formed a theory that Real change, uh, paradigm shifting change, is most likely to happen from big, large, well-resourced, public-facing companies. Mm -hmm. So I set about my journey after that pivot to work in companies and to work in the corporate affairs space. As you know, because that's where we met, uh, mm -hmm. first at American Express, which um, I thoroughly enjoyed, and then at the Estee Lauder companies, which was great because that's a company and a family, very uh, public facing, very engaged civically. Mm -hmm. And for the last 12 years at Pfizer, and it keeps me there because the mission, Breakthroughs That Change Patients' Lives, has always felt important, but feels particularly important now that we're talking in the middle of a pandemic. Yes, for sure. Um, also, I think for you and me both, um, American Express was a great brand. I've written about it in The Caring Economy. Um, I think that Harvey Golub as CEO when we were there uh, initially and then Ken Chenault subsequently really set a tone and led by example. Um, and I, I think you also, when I look at your fantastic uh, accomplishments, you've had the good fortune of working with great leaders. And um, we we'll want to touch upon that a little bit today. I, I wonder if, for example, you might share a little bit of some of the traits that you've observed uh, in great leaders along the way, or conversely, what are some of the warning signs that say back away from the gap when you're, um, you're being courted for a new job or meeting someone for the first time? Sure. Happy to comment on all of that. And um, you do cover the American Express years very, very well in your book, which is a great book, by the way. I really enjoyed reading it. Thank you. Um, I've had the, the privilege, the honor, uh, the opportunity to support nine CEOs over the course of my 30 plus year career. Wow. And each one was special and um, brought something unique to the table. To answer your question, Toby, is a very thoughtful question. The ones that were the best were the leaders who had their own voice, who really know what they believe what they feel, that they are able to speak from the heart. They don't need talking points for every engagement to have a core and a, and a philosophy. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones I find most inspiring. And I'm sure you've heard this saying many times, but you know, you know who a leader is because they have followers. Mm -hmm. And um, several people like Ken Chenault was a natural leader because he had so many followers. Her, his ascension to the CEO ship was you know, cemented by that, that uh, group of followers he had in the company. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the one thing I learned is a death trap among CEOs is insecurity. Mm -hmm. Insecurity is bedeviling, undermining, leads to bad behavior. And I, I would use that as you say, as a warning sign if you're considering going to work for someone and they strike you as insecure, mm -hmm. I would run. <laughs> the gut check. <laughs> yeah, you know, speaking of Ken, um, I'm hoping to, to actually invite him onto the show um, in the subsequent uh, episode. He, as you and I both know, is one of the really first great African American leaders to rise to CEO role um, after years of hard work and he really earned it. 
um, and just such a such a, a decent gentleman, right? As well as in the trenches with the employees, again, really set the tone. So I I, I wonder if um, if you might reflect on that a little bit with me. I, we want to hear more about Pfizer, particularly around um, around CSR and uh, healthcare and the pandemic. But I would like to eventually come back to Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and all that's going on right now, real time, which affects all of us. But why don't we first start There's with- There's a lot going on right now. Right? <laughs> Drinking from a fire hydrant. But it's all quite exciting, I think, for people like you, mm -hmm. because we kind of have always been front. We've always known that what we say will be repeated on the cover of the New York Times or that we have to have our act together. Um, so we treat it carefully, but also with crisis communications, it's, um, it's where the opportunity is as well as the danger. So mm. um, we'll come back to that. But why don't you first, if you would, Sally, um, as the um, Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at Pfizer, would you give us a sort of general overview of Pfizer and CSR, the sort of 30,000 foot perspective? Sure. Um, Pfizer has a very strong and long-standing tradition of corporate social responsibility. I think it's very common in healthcare companies and pharmaceutical companies in particular to know that you have to engage to continue to have the license from society to operate. We're not selling a widget or a fashion item. Um, and, and so the bar for us is very, very high. I, I sometimes tell a little joke that, you know, I left a company, Estee Lauder, that was beloved, utterly beloved, that made lipstick. And I went to a company that makes life-saving medicine, but wasn't liked in every corner. <laughs> and so I, I studied that question and I thought deeply about that question. And I realized it's because when it comes to your medicine, your, your health, your family's health, the bar is really high. The expectations are really high. And so having a robust corporate social responsibility program at Pfizer is important. And I'd like to just touch quickly, Toby, on two, two things we do that I think are very, very important. Um, first, we, we've made a commitment to eradicate blinding trachoma in sub-Saharan Africa. And so that is a donation of Zithromax along with education tools. And I've been in these countries and seen the dosing programs and how villages are learning about things like uh, washing hands rituals and, you know, safe, uh, safe toilets and good clean water practices. And I love having a goal that we want to eliminate this pro problem. It's very inspiring and it means a lot. So that's one. The other one, which I just love, is our Global Health Fellows, where we take, uh, it's a skills-based volunteering. I know you know a lot about that. Mm -hmm. And so if people have worked at the company for several years, they're, they're given the opportunity to go into the field. And the field could be Southeast Asia. It could be, you know, it could be somewhere in the United States. It could be somewhere where there's a need and their skills, whether that's managing cold chain or you know, financial advising or other healthcare advocacy are put into use. And the reason I love it, because to me, corporate responsibility is really about showing your corporate character. And people who don't like pharmaceutical companies often don't know anyone who works at one. And giving the opportunity for our people to be in the field and to be known it's great for, for the good that it generates, but also for the reflection it puts on the company. Mm -hmm. May I ask you um, a two-part question on that? One, just for you personally, have you actually been a participant in the, um, the Health Fellows Program? Have you taken that sort of break, so to speak? It's so funny you ask that. You know, I would love to, um, and I dream of this, but unfortunately, it seems that my job somehow disqualifies me for this opportunity to go six months into the field. But it is an ambition of mine. It is a goal of mine. Yeah, because I, I do, I do, I do go visit people when they're yeah. on their missions. And um, I'm always so, they're, they're lit from within when they're doing this kind of work. It's really very exciting. Well, you know, I, I, I know that because I love following you on LinkedIn. And I see when you're out in the field. And I always give you the thumbs up because I know you and I know the work you're doing, the important work you're doing. But 
Um, yeah, I guess there's only so much time in the day as well. And you have such a big role there. Uh, again, we're with Sally Sussman, who's the EVP and Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at Pfizer. Um, Sally, building on that, uh, those two ex fantastic examples of Pfizer's CSR, I'd like to ask you about global versus local, or sometimes what we call global, um, particularly in this tumultuous era we're seemingly li li living in. Um, it's great that you're doing all these things globally, but I would imagine you also re you get some jealousies or rivals rivalries or resistance about, well, why aren't you doing more here or in my backyard? How do you balance both corporately and then just professionally yourself? How do you balance the international from the domestic if you do? Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised you're asking this question. I know you've always had a passion around mm -hmm. um, global issues. The world as a connected place. You know, there's two, there, there is so much demand that we will never ever be able to meet it. So what I encourage our team is to really have a strong definition of what it is we do, which also is what we don't do. Mm -hmm. And so that the decisions of yes and no become easier. So we really focus on global health and healthcare disparities. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we're not interested in, in going to a gala in particular. We're not that kind of company. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to keep these definitions and boundaries so that we can have impact. Mm -hmm. And I, I would argue, Toby, that the same is true for a person, for an individual. And I know you're familiar with this. The, the number of people that knock on your door and say, can you help me with this? Will you join us in that? You want to say yes, because these are all wonderful people and good causes. But I, I think it's important to sort of shape your priorities. And mm -hmm. for me right now, I really have two priorities. My work at Pfizer helping right now to bring forward a vaccine for COVID and the work that I do at the International Rescue Committee, mm -hmm. um, trying to support refugees who I believe are among the most vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard to say no. It's painful to say no, but you're actually doing a kindness because you're not spreading yourself so thin and losing your ability to have impact. Absolutely. I, I, I'm glad our listeners are hearing that. And I will come back to the IRC where I know you are co-chair uh, of the board there with fantastic leadership. But before we do that, I want to ask you a bit more about your colleagues at Pfizer. How do you, how do you get them engaged? Obviously, the majority of people there share the mission, the vision, and are on board. And I believe you have fantastic retention there um, and recruitment capabilities. But there's always going to be, I think we have to accept the fact that sometimes there are going to be people who just don't want to, for whatever reasons, be a part of the CSR or the, the corporate commitments. Um, but we still have to give them the opportunity and give them our our reasoning for it. How do you how do you do it at Pfizer? And um, you know, it's like that old line: How do you, you get lead a horse to water? How do you get it to drink? Kind of thing. How do you deal with um, those who aren't quite familiar with or share the passion that um, other colleagues do around CSR? Mm -hmm. You know, um, Pfizer has about ninety thousand employees, and it is again one of the most purpose driven environments I've ever been a part of. And it isn't, it isn't difficult, really, to get people to want to get involved. In fact, um, I probably have the uh, opposite problem, which is too many volunteers. Um, you can't always put people to work in this area. But it's, what I think is particularly interesting is being in a science-driven company. Mm. And scientists, it's not a sexy uh, profession. Scientists don't get into science to get rich and or to be famous in particular. And in many cases, one scientist will take the work of their predecessor, decades of work, work on it their whole career, and then turn it over to their successor, mm. laboring in anonymity, really, um, as you know, it takes decades and decades to build cures and new treatments and new novel therapies. Mm -hmm. So these are, you know, very good spirited people who really care. And they're there to make a difference. And so CSR is a logical next step for them. Great. Um, do you, have you, just sort of for fun, do you, do you have a moment that you ref reflect upon of a colleague who 
either had an aha moment or one of these scientists who you just saw the passion come out because it could be a recognition an award it could be a story that you were involved in with the media but um it's quite special i think when you see it personalized uh, in a colleague are you talking about csr specifically well, uh, CSR, but more broadly, I should say just purpose-driven sort of recognition, accomplishment, feeling like you're on the right side of history. It could be a younger colleague, could be an older colleague, but I feel like you know when you've touched really the soul of a colleague by whatever mm -hmm. that you've done. Mm -hmm. It's funny that you asked me this question because I believe we're having our aha moment right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the drug industry is a beleaguered industry um, in its reputation and, um, you know, it's full of failure as, as all science uh, industries are. You spend more time, you know, not so little of what you, what you work on actually makes its way through to be in advance. In fact, you know, you and I um, were both involved in the early 90s with the um, gay civil rights movement and the, the, the traumas around HIV and losing young men to AIDS death. So that was also a very purposeful time in the industry because now, you know, people can live with HIV for a very long time. And I believe we're on the cusp of a vaccine for, for HIV. So you get these moments every couple of decades, really, where you get this once in a lifetime or two or three times in a lifetime opportunity to make an impact difference. And the work that we're doing right now is taking a, a process of vaccine development that can last anywhere from four to 12 years and trying to do it in three or four months mm. and taking processes that are linear. First you develop, first you, you try to discover something that then you test it in, in rats and then you test it in primates, mm. then you test it in humans, then you buy raw material, then you reconfigure your line and begin to produce. We're doing all of that at once wow. um, with this kind of, again, a moonshot moment that we will be producing vaccines before we know if they're safe, efficacious, and approved. Mm -hmm. uh, so that when, and if they are, and I believe they will be, we'll be ready. I yes. mean, the world, the world really needs this vaccine. Yes. Well, uh, that's so inspiring. Again, we're with EVP and Chief Corporate Affairs Officer Sally Sussman from Pfizer. Sally, um, I'm, I'm also reminded that here we are all these years later, post HIV AIDS, and Anthony Fauci is with us in the middle of it all again. It's kind of like, wow. Um, He's amazing. He's amazing. He's amazing. You know, and, it, it's interesting. I'm sorry to, to cut you off, but um, one of the things I found so interesting is I was reading in the Edelman Trust Barometer, mm -hmm which I, I highly recommend to your listeners. It's a great tool um, that the, um, the, the public wants to get their information from doctors and scientists, not from politicians, not from guys in suits, but the real people who know the science. And that's what I think Dr. Fauci does such an incredible job. Um, Sally, let's, let's, uh, I do want to hear a little bit about IRC and also about Black Lives Matter. Uh, but before we leave the COVID, I know that you guys, I think you sort of reamped your, um, your podcast. You have your own podcast there, I believe, The Antigen. Yes, we um, do. Let's give that a little plug for our audience, please. Tell us about it. Thank you. Um, the Antigen is, is a podcast that we have with a science expert who she leads it. And what it really is and why I think it's interesting is it's part of the communications revolution as we're looking to find new and direct channels to speak to people directly in, in a great format like this. So thank you for the chance to mention it. Of course, I'm going to tune in and I hope all my listeners will. Again, folks, we are with Sally Sussman, EVP, Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at Pfizer. Sally's also co-chair of the board at the International Rescue Committee, and we'd love to hear her talk a little bit about how that both dovetails with her work at Pfizer and how it tugs on her heartstrings and how she and her colleagues are making that organization even more amazing and successful than it already is. Sally, give us a little overview, please. Thanks very much, Toby, for that, that opportunity to talk about the International Rescue Committee. Um, a mutual friend of ours, our, our former boss, Tom Schick, was involved in the IRC and asked me to get involved. And I didn't have a refugee past or a refugee history. 
So I hadn't really heard about it and I looked into it and studied it and learned that the IRC was um, founded by Albert Einstein following World War II in the belief that no one should float around in a boat with nowhere to land. And it became you know, a very important uh, NGO that attracted a lot of smart and thoughtful people to it. Every living former Secretary of State is on our board of advisors. And I, I really enjoy the work and I'm particularly inspired by David Miliband, who's our CEO, uh, former Secretary of State in the UK. Um, and then more recently, as the refugee uh, situation became much, much more uh, you know, intense and, and so many people on the move, fleeing violence and, and other forms of oppression, it, it's really become an overwhelmingly positive part of my life to be honored enough to have an opportunity to help these people who are so brave you know, I never think of a refugee as a victim. I, I think of a refugee as a hero because they have picked up their family. They've, they've left their homes, their comforts, their safety to pursue a, a better life. It's, it's the ultimate American story to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I thoroughly enjoy my work there. I have visited refugee camps. I've seen the resettlement back here in the United States and really had the honor of meeting some of these refugees who are great, great citizens. Mm -hmm. You know, Sally, um, that resonates with me also because um, I think a lot of our listeners see things on the news but don't realize how vast and complex this situation is for refugees. You know, we've heard a lot about Syria through the years, but then there's Venezuela. It's a constant flux and it's not going to just go away as the news cycle moves on. So. Kudos to you. I also found I had some clients in last summer. I took them over to IRC, some tech billionaires from San Francisco who were interested in the work there. And what I learned that reinforced my, um, my sort of wow factor with IRC was what they're doing with Sesame Street Workshop. Um, who doesn't love Sesame Street? But to have <laughs> a first refugee character on Sesame Street and to be actually doing the delivery of content for these refugee students in these camps was just phenomenal. I mean, really thoughtful and holistic. Yeah, thank you for making that visit um, and for learning a bit more. We were um, fortunate to win a MacArthur grant in partnership with Sesame Street to provide a program of education for children who are in refugee camps. I mean, one of the most stunning facts I think I've ever heard is that the average person stays in a refugee camp something like 17 years. Wow. So, you know, it's not this idea that you, you transit in and you transit out. I, when I was in Camp Kakuma, Kakuma in, um, in Kenya, I asked what was the most frequent medical procedure that happens in the camp. And I, I you know, I didn't know what it would be. Mm -hmm. It's birth. Wow. You know, yeah. So it really, really forces you to reorient your sense that this is a, it's not a short term, easily fixed problem. And it really... Our, our ability to help these people speaks directly to our ability to help ourselves mm -hmm. in the kind of world that we want to create. Agreed. It makes us human. Um, Sally, I'm mindful of the time. Just a couple more questions here. Um, Black Lives Matter, George Floyd. I, I love and respect both your, for your focus on your IRC work and Pfizer's on health care. Um, but of course, Black Lives Matter matters to us as well. How has that, how's that been um, addressed? broadly at Pfizer these past few weeks. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Toby, for, for bringing it up. It's a conversation we need to keep having. And yes. um, I think that Black Lives Matter and the, the murder of George Floyd at the hands of the police is something that we all need to keep talking about and that large companies like Pfizer are very engaged in a conversation. Um, our CEO, myself, and a few others met with Pfizer's Global Black Community. I had a town hall this week with my department to hear the stories, to invite and ask our Black colleagues to share their experiences inside and outside Pfizer. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to think deeply about how can this moment be different? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen people killed uh, at the hands of police 
many times and it seemed like it just goes on and, and it happened and we'd, we'd move on and it would happen again. And I, I actually think that COVID and the remote working may provide an opportunity that people are perhaps feeling more vulnerable themselves, more tuned in. Mm -hmm. um, we're leading quieter lives basically and not racing around running to business trips or restaurants we're we're quieter and i'm i'm hoping that means that this issue finally gets the the reflection that it deserves and the attention that it demands mm -hmm. and um the head of pfizer's global black community a gentleman named bert bruce said that what we need to do is to be doers yes. um, so we listen we learn but then there's an obligation to do and and so many of my white colleagues have said to me, I, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know what to say. And I think just start simple. Mm -hmm. Attend a protest. Teach your children mm -hmm. what is right and wrong. Correct your parents if they, you know, are uneducated. Or make some even simple steps are important, but step taking we must do. Absolutely. And ask questions, right? I, I, mm. I'm trying to, in every circle, professional, familial, uh, social, to not only talk about this, but then say, all right, now what about us guys, gals? What, what can we be doing to make sure that this time is not different? Um, I've also, I don't think, I haven't had a chance to catch up with you, but I've just um, joined the city's um, test and trace corps as a supervisor. So I'm going to be doing that as well, which as you know, is so um, has had such an impact on black, black and brown people. So that's going to be quite education, I hope, helpful for me and for the cause. So let's keep on it. That's very cool. Yeah, so Sally Sussman, I want to thank you. I have one quick question, but first, uh, this is Sally Sussman from Pfizer, the fantastic, wonderful EVP and Chief Corporate Affairs Officer, longtime friend and colleague of mine, Toby Usnick, here on The Caring Economy. Sally, I've written my book. You've said you are writing a book or want to write a book. Anything you want to share in advance for any of our listeners? Oh, thank you, Toby. You are so sweet. You know, I love writing. Um, I, I find writing to be an incredible ritual of clarification. And I've taken um, several attempts at the various novels and memoirs. And I think I've come to realize my form is the essay. Mm -hmm. So I've been writing a lot of essays. Um, some have been, I had one published recently in Time Magazine about my hair. <laughs> okay, so it's not all serious. Um, and, I, and I also appreciated you mentioning um, my LinkedIn. I, I, very, I, I work very hard to put out content to people that I, I hope they find engaging. And I'm very grateful to LinkedIn. I think it's a tremendous vehicle for getting one's views, especially about the workplace out there. So I agree. I'm finding so, my way. All right. So <laughs> we're going to promote your LinkedIn profiles as much as we can. I think also to your point that helps with Black Lives Matter and these other causes like the IRC. You have platforms, use them. Ladies and gentlemen, again, I want to thank Sally Sussman from Pfizer. And uh, I really appreciate your joining us here on The Caring Economy with Toby Usnick. Have a great day.